30 seconds, why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, what do you, th what do you think your purpose is in being in this life now? <clears throat> Okay, fantastic. Well, as a, as a lot of uh, very, very godly people do, uh, when they're thinking about that question, you know, they turn to Google. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't, but it says on Google here, here's a few I found, okay? It says, having a strong sense of family. That's what some people believe their purpose was in life. Giving back to the community, all good stuff. Living a healthy lifestyle, embracing spirituality, Al's interpretation, embracing anything and everything, <laughs> all different types of experiences, largely outside of God, helping children, prioritizing fitness, <laughs> gotta work on that one. And helping animals. Now, I just need to say something. Kira's here. She's a witness, okay? Last week at Life Group, I thought I'd gone to a Cats Anonymous meeting, right? Because when we introduced ourselves, one after the next, they're going, yeah, I've got a cat. Oh, I love my cat. Oh, I need to get two or three cats. And I'm sitting there thinking, God bless you, cats. And I, I love cats that belong to other people. And I love dogs that belong to other people. I just have to say something at the beginning of my sermon. I, I prefer dogs, right? But I'm not getting a dog, all right? Sorry, because I refuse to pick up poo with a plastic bag and carry it around to find a wee bin to put it in. So if you've got a dog or a cat, bless you. I'll come around your house and we'll have a nice time but I'm not buying any dogs, all right? A goldfish, easy. A wee seed now and then, pop it in, fills its belly up, that's it done for the day, swims around, gets the exercise, nice and easy, all right? Keep it simple. All joking aside, what, what is your purpose? All, all, all these things are good things, but what is it you, in the, the old blues song, what am I living for? But for you, what, what, what are you living for? What is it that really ultimately deep inside rocks your boat? Today we're going to look at finding your purpose. And we're going to look at a man whose name was Saul. He changed his name. His name was changed later to Paul. But for starters, he was called Saul. So we're going to read from Acts chapter 9. Here goes. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats. Did you like that wee Glaswegian? Murderous there's one more thing. Mur There's been a murder. <laughs> murderous. He was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, praise God, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard the voice say to him, Saul. Saul, why do you persecute me? By the way, a little pause. This struck me today for the first time in ages. Jesus never said, why do you persecute my people? It's personal. When you persecute his people, you persecute him. He says, why do you persecute me? You're hurting me. By the way, you treat my people. You're against me, actually, not just against my people. Wow. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless, as you would. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, or <clears throat> there's a very pucker friend of mine years ago said, Ananias. 
I've never heard anybody pronounce his name as Ananias, Ananias, but I call him Ananias. I hope that's okay for anybody who's a linguist. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this guy and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, this is beautiful. Does he say Saul? What does he say? Brother Saul. Wow. Brother Saul. Not just Saul. Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus. Let's pause. Not the Lord Jesus. It feels like the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. What a beautiful story. Anybody in the room believe that an encounter with Jesus changes everything? That's what it's all about. An encounter with the living Jesus Christ changes everything. The first thing, if you're taking notes, I want to look at is this. We have here a transformed motivation. What, what is it that motivates this man in his life? What is it that he is living for? What is his purpose? Well, he says, beautiful chapter in Galatians 1, it says there, for you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism. You've heard about me. I was, he says, and intensely persecuting Christians. Not saying all Jewish people do that, but he was one who wanted to come against this bunch of people who said, we've discovered who the Messiah is. It's this man, Jesus. He didn't like it. He tried to destroy the church of God. That's maybe an understatement. He was advanced in a religious lifestyle. I think there's often two normal ways people go. They either become engrossed in religiosity or they become engrossed in rebellion. There's very few go in the middle. There's a whole bunch of people say, that's a load of rubbish, that Christianity. I'll live my life any way I like. I'll do my own thing. Who cares? Rebellion. Open rebellion. But how many people know that you can live a very religious life and be a rebel? Because you follow a system of belief that lacks life, lacks power. You've got rules and regs. I don't know, call it what you like. Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, Islam, Judaism, Shintoism. Call it what you like. Any ism, any other religion. You can follow the rules and regs and hope at the end of the day you'll be good enough. But the very root of it is God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not enough. I'll find my own way. The root of rebellion. This man, although a very religious man, was a rebel. He wasn't living the way he should be. He hadn't encountered up to this point the risen Jesus. He was extremely zealous for the tradition of his fathers. Now, <clears throat> fathers are important. If you talk to any children that I teach in my school, some will have good examples of fathers, some will have terrible examples of fathers, and some won't have a father because of death or sometimes, who, who knows, maybe even imprisonment. This man was respectful of his fathers, as in his ancestors. But ending in the room with me, not everything our fathers or our mothers have taught us has led us in the right path. I'm grateful to God. For 
for a father and mother that did lead me to Christ. But that's not everybody's story. Other people have different stories. So, healthy respect, yes. Extremely zealous, this guy. But he was zealous for something that was leading away from the way. Taking him somewhere in a different direction. And he was motivated by self-righteousness. You know that kind of person that just thinks they're right about everything? They think that the way they do their life is the right way and everybody else should be copying them. This guy was extremely religious. And you can be extremely religious and miss the grace of God. Some of our churches are full of it. And also into the bargain, some cultures in our world, it's culturally acceptable to be Christian. It's culturally acceptable to go to church. I'm not here to win your hearts just to go to church. I'm here to win your hearts to a person. And when you meet this person, you'll want to go to church because you want to be with people who are like-minded, who love this person. That's Jesus Christ himself. That's what it's all about. But listen to this. I've got great news for you. Praise God. He never stayed like this. If you go to Acts 26, he says, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. When this Jesus spoke to me, I was obedient. I never rebelled. I thought, wow, I'm going to go with this. This guy's someone else. Listen to what happens to him. It's amazing. I'm not going to go to all the verses. I've put them up there for you. He receives physical healing. On the third day, he gets his eyesight back. Wonderful. He gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, some people say, well, Alistair, you know what happened when he got filled with the Holy Spirit? What were the signs of the, the, the evidence that he got filled? I can tell you this. Acts does not say there and then he spoke in tongues. But it does say in Corinthians, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. So I'm not going to speculate, but here's what I'm going to tell you. And this is utterly biblical. If you go on to Acts 9 and verse 20, it says, at once, once he got filled with the Holy Spirit, once he got baptized in water, it says, at once, he went out and he powerfully declared that Jesus is the Son of God. And it even says later, he grew more and more and more powerful in declaring that Jesus is the Christ. I'm going to tell you what happened when he got filled with the Holy Spirit. He got power. And anybody read Acts chapter 1 will know. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He got power. Uh, uh, you might think, oh, you love that kind of thing. You're quite enthusiastic. You know, you're quite extrovert. You could go on the streets and you could do... Well, it's nerve-wracking for me. But for some of us in the room, it's probably even more nerve-wracking. That's how I know we need power. If I said to you right now, come on guys, girls, let's head up to the high street. There's a few hundred people around. Any of you want to stand up and just testify how the Lord has saved you and he's transformed your life? Uh, that would be a wonderful way to empty most churches. You know? Let's be honest. A lot of us would go, out of here. We need power. And by the way, it's not all about on the streets. It's about your next door neighbor. It's about the lady or the gentleman that sits next to you in the office. It's about the mother or the father you meet at the school gate. Yeah? We need power. This man got power in the Holy Spirit. Praise God. He grows more and more powerful. Next slide, please. More and more powerful, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now, uh, you've got to say this because it's in the Word of God. We don't fudge it. Uh, he received death threats. I found at least two occasions when I was re researching for this, this talk at least two occasions where people tried to kill him. This is not very popular, but I'm going to say it. Peter says, if you want to live a godly life, you can expect suffering. Or the church goes, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. No, usually they don't. Because in my heart, in my sinful flesh, in all our sinful fleshes, let's be honest, we prefer comfort. We prefer 
Hallelujah, bless God, I've got my new super duper, brand new spanking car, it's my third one, and I've got my 26 acre ranch, bless the Lord, hallelujah, I'm prospering in the Lord, bless you, and I mean it genuinely, bless you, but wait a minute, how do you act when somebody gives you grief for being a Christian? How do you act when you get persecuted? How do you, get, how do you act when the government of the day tries to marginalize you and shut you up and tell you you can't say that anymore? And in some cultures in the world, the young people today are looking at the persecuted church. In some parts of the world today, the brothers and sisters are weeping because they don't understand why we don't get it. The parts of the world in China today, they think, I'll give my life to Jesus Christ, and if it means I die for him, glory, praise God. That's how they live. And they look at the Western church and go, you, you, you can't get to the prayer meeting because Manchester City are on. Sorry, guys, I probably shouldn't have said that. Nothing, nothing against Manchester City. Are you hearing my heart here? Come on. All in. Or you're all out. I don't think there's a middle ground. Old Tom, I told you before, not you, bro. <laughs> Old Tom at church, son, if he's not Lord of all, he ain't Lord at all. That's what an old guy told me growing up in the church. If he ain't Lord of all, he ain't Lord at all. There are two words in the English language that do not go. They are no Lord. <clears throat> they cannot exist. If he's Lord, it's yes. It's not no Lord. If he's the Lord of your life, you don't turn around to him and say no. If he's the Lord and you've given your life in completely to him, then yes is the answer. Every time he comes calling, whatever he asks, whatever he wants to do, it'll always be good. It will not always be easy, but it will always be good because he's good. He's good. He never does anything that's evil. He never does anything with a heart of sinful, evil intent because that's not his character. And finally, he receives a cold reception from fellow Christians. So here's what happens. This man, the Christians hear about him. He's nasty. He's trying to destroy the church. They hear about him that he's become a Christian and he heads up to meet some of them. And he walks in the door and they go, oh no, look who's shown up. They give him a cold response, cold shoulder, because they've heard about him. He's the one that persecutes Christians. And you know what? I don't know. Slight speculation here. It may even be that guy persecuted some of my family or some of my friends. I've heard about this guy. This is where it gets right to the point. Who's your solitarsis? Who would walk in today that would make you go, Who'd walk through that door today that would make you go, oh no, what are they doing here? They've become a Christian. What on earth? I know what they were like. I know how they used to behave. Come on, church. Don't kid me on now that you would all go, oh, lovely to see you, my ex-husband. <laughs> Who wasn't very nice. Or someone else. What is God doing saving them? Oh! Listen to the words of this hymn. Isn't it amazing what sticks with you? 57 years of age, it still sticks with me. Listen to this. It came to me today. I wasn't even thinking about it. Just asking the Lord, what do you want to say? Here it is. The vilest offender. who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. And if you don't know the song, it goes on to go, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, 
Let the earth hear his voice. That's the one. I'll say it one more time. The vilest offender. That means the child abuser who repents and believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and gets their sins forgiven should come in here and find a home. The vilest alcoholic beating up his wife drunkard of a husband who turns up and who's found Christ, he comes home. Add anybody to your list that you want, the boss at work who's cruel to you. Add who you like. Here's the beauty of the gospel. It saves the vilest offender. Some Christians get offended by God's mercy. What's he doing forgiving him? What's he doing forgiving her? Thank God for his mercy and his grace. Because we're all stuffed without him. Whether you think you're a good guy or a bad guy, whether you think you've been desperately wicked or quite a nice religious person, we were all lost. Oh, what a saviour. What a saviour. How fantastic is he? No wonder this guy gets changed. And this is what we need. We don't want a church is just full of people who like to go to church. That's great. We want people coming to know Jesus saying, I'm different. I'm transformed. My motivation's different now. I don't want to live a self-righteous, pompous life. I want to follow this man, Jesus Christ. You know what? What was Saul's newfound purpose? I think in a nutshell it's this. To know Christ and to make him known, whatever the cost. One more time. To know Christ. Not know about him solely. To know him. It's like a lover. Beautiful. I want to embrace you. I want to kiss you. I want to come close to you. I want to hold you. Don't never let me go. To know him. And to make him known, and I'm going to say, whatever the cost. For him, boy, it's quite a cost. For some people in this room, boy, it's been quite a cost. How about you? What truly motivates you in your life? The other stuff we talked about, raising children, beautiful, all good, godly, all good stuff. But you know what? What must undergird all of that is, Alistair, whatever I do, I want to live for the glory of Jesus Christ. I want to get to know him and I want to make him known by my lifestyle, by my words, by my actions, by everything about me. Beautiful. Secondly, he has an eternal perspective. Last week, we had some great stuff from Goff talking about things he's been through in his life and how he's pressing on. He's looking forward to being with Christ one day, but he's trusting God with each day, making the most of each day, making it count. And Paul says this in Philippians. He says, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. The Christian has a hope that death is a gateway to something beautiful. The world does not have that hope. For most people in the world, it's a gateway to uncertainty. What happens when I die? Where do I go? What, 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 what goes on? With some people, not sure, don't have much idea at all what it's about. But for the believer, Paul says, to live right now is to live for Jesus Christ. And he says, if I die, well... It's even better. Not better for those that are left. That's tough. But it's better for the believer. Anybody in the room looking forward to seeing Jesus? Because I am. I don't want to go yet. But I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus. Those nail pierced hands. Where faith gives place to sight. 
We'll see him as he really, really is. And we'll just, I don't know, hug him. I'll kiss him. I'll tell him how much I'm grateful for all he's done. It's all about him. It's all about how great he is. If you want to know about Christianity, it's all about how great Jesus is. That's what it's all about. Paul says, death has been swallowed up in victory. The believer's perspective of death should be totally different from the unbeliever's perspective on death. And he says, where, oh, death is your victory? That suggests you haven't got one. Where, oh, death is your sting? But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, this guy not only has a transformed motivation, he's got the big picture. He says, I know where I'm going. And if God decides it's time for me to go, then I'll be, I'll be ready. I'm going to live a brilliant life there with Christ. I'm going to love it. And then he goes on to say, but for the time being, God's made it clear. I've got to stay here for a wee while longer. I've got some jobs to do. The Father's got some jobs for me to do. And that's beautiful as well. But that heart that says heaven or being in the presence of Christ is not some terrible thing for me. It's a beautiful thing. I just see it like a little tunnel, a little tunnel you walk through and you go, I'm leaving this life and I'm heading off to a new one, a better one than ever you could have before. Hallelujah. If you think when you look back now how much he's worthy, boy, you wait till you see him face to face. The sense of how worthy he is will be through the roof even for our most introverted friends. It'll be through the roof. You might even jump. You might even dance. You might even go crazy. It'll be through the roof. Fantastic. And finally, the third point is this, a unique life path. Jesus had a unique path for this man, Saul, who became Paul. Guess what? Jesus has got a unique path for you. It might not look exactly the same as Paul's. That's okay but he's got a unique path for you. Now, is that something to get all worried about and panic about? No, relax. Uh, let me just suggest you could start by saying, Jesus, please show me what it is you would like me to give myself to. I want to follow your heart. I want to follow you. Do what pleases you. Let me know what's on your heart, Lord. Are you okay with that? That's what you do. You don't panic and try and get a 36-point plan off the internet, how you discover yourself. You just... You're already secure in Christ Jesus. That's your identity. That's where you lie. I'm not, I'm not, my identity is not in being Scottish. My identity is not even in being a male. My identity fundamentally is being in Christ Jesus. That's the only identity fundamentally that matters in the light of eternity. And that's exactly what's going on. Now listen to this. He's got a unique path. If we go to, just very briefly, Acts 26, it says there, what his specific um, path was. It says in verses 16 to 18, here we go. Jesus says, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you've seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins in a place among those who are set apart by faith or sanctified by faith in me. Guy's got a pretty big job, hasn't he? He's supposed to go to the Jews, he's supposed to go to the Gentiles, and he's supposed to declare these wonderful things that have happened to him with Christ and more that Christ will show him. He's got a pretty big job, uh, probably bigger than most of us, all right? But here's the thing. If the Lord says to you, I want you to be the most spirit-filled mother you could ever be. I want you to help raise your children, invest in a godly way in their, your kids, show them me, teach them about me, pray with them, raise them up, or you could be a father, a similar thing. Listen to me, never, ever, ever underestimate what God calls you to do. If God called you to do that and nothing else, do it. And it's incredibly valuable. Because when God asks you to do something and you do it, 
that's where the blessing comes. A story was told years ago about Terry Virgo, who was a, a, a leading apostle in New Frontiers, and he, and he said at the end of a message to the people in the, in the, the gathering, hands up, hands up, stand up those who've been blessed today by hearing the word. And quite a few people stood up at the end of the service and said, yeah, thanks, Terry, that was a nice word. And, all. and he says, I'm really sorry to tell you guys, but you've been a little bit deceived here. He says, because the word of God says, you're blessed when you hear it and you do it. So the doing of it, the living out of the word of God is where you get the blessing. So mums, let me encourage you, do it with all you got. Do it with the power and help of the Holy Spirit. Dads, be great dads. If you did nothing else in this life, our society's crying out for it. If you did nothing else, good, godly, Holy Spirit-filled dads who show the most important thing they show their kids is how they love their wives. Probably. Your kids will forget many things in years to come. But my goodness, they will remember how you treat their mother. So treat their mother, treat, treat their mother well, respectfully, lovingly, kindly. Do what you do, but do it to the glory of God. And if that was all you did in terms of serving God, I know there's a lot more. If that's all you did, it's still massively important and massively valuable. Why? Because you're investing in a generation to come who will do this who will go to the ends of the earth and they'll plant churches and they'll bring people to Jesus. You've got to see it like that. Don't just you, don't you see it as, oh, I'm looking after the kids. You've got to see this. Is, you, you're investing. I wasn't planning to say all this, but you're investing in lives that will bring change for the future. Praise God for the patient Sunday school teachers, you know, who who uh, invested in me and they hung in there and they kept teaching me and parents as well and others working together, parents wherever possible and, and, and children's workers. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Okay, recognizing your uniqueness. In this room, each one of us is unique. So that means each one of us brings something different to the party, so to speak. All right, and that's okay, right? There's some people in here who will love to read theological papers that are very, very deep and they will love it and they'll get their teeth into it and they'll go, come on, this is brilliant, this rocks my boat. And other people will go, okay, uh, I prefer to just have a friend round, have a cuppa, offer to pray. That's where I find my sweet spot. Or somebody else may say, I just love picking up my guitar or my, or my trombone. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, write, and, write a few, and write a few worship songs. You, you do what you do. It's great. But listen to me. It's really important to realize that everybody, everybody is unique. And everybody has unique gifts and talents and indeed spiritual gifts. So what have you got to offer? Just come to the Lord and say, here I am. This is what I got, Lord. Do you know, I saw a beautiful thing. I don't know if we'd ever do this at Redeemer. Maybe. Um, I have nothing against it, it's a great idea. I saw one church once where they had an easel and a, a, and a canvas and it was empty and somebody who was particularly good at painting just came up to the front during worship, song worship, grabs a hold of the paintbrush, starts to paint a prophetic picture. That's powerful. You look at the picture and God's speaking through art. That's way out my league. I am not, I am not good at art, right? That's just not going to happen. I might get a prophetic word now and then, but I probably won't get, I'll go up there and paint a prophetic. <laughs> that probably might not be a blessing to you. Who's that little stick man up there? Yeah, that's about all you get from Al. But if that's you, let's try and make room for that. Let's look for ways in which we can uniquely bring something to the body. And, and, and the next point is this, think holistically. It's not about what can I do that will satisfy my needs to be feeling accepted in the church. <laughs> no, we think holistically. We think, what could we all bring yeah, that will be a blessing to the whole body so that we can grow together? So if you've got a tremendous trombone ministry, God bless you. The trombone, I'm sure, is great. Uh, but let's see how we can work it in with the rest of the worship team. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise by the way, I hope I'm not offending you. Does anybody play the trombone? Thank you, Lord. Yeah, thank you, Lord. <laughs> but it's not, about, it's not about me and my trombone. It's about how can I serve God's people together with others with my trombone. That's what it's about. All right, it's, that's how it works. And 
The next point on the next slide is go on a journey of discovery. Uh, look for opportunities to serve and have a go. Anybody honestly in the room, put your hand up, just be, be honest. Anybody in early life as a Christian, when you gathered together with other Christians, did anybody just have a go at anything? Did anybody just see something needing to be done, offer to help, or just had a go at trying something and weren't even very sure if it was something they were particularly good at? Is, am I the only one? Has anybody else ever done that? Like, oh, that's good, there's about three of us. Thanks, Mum. Thanks, Auntie. Uh, <laughs> But basically, sometimes it might just mean you roll up and you say, uh, how can I help put the chairs out? Or how can I help pack away? How can I help serve people some drinks? You know, it's about going on a journey of discovering where your gifts and your strengths lie or your areas of weakness. But our areas of weakness are never an excuse for saying, ah, well, see you later, you can all do it. We look out for each other. You know what I love? One of the things I love, very practical things I love about our family here, at the end of the service, when a whole bunch of people just grab some chairs, yeah, and they stack them up, and we don't go, and well, that's down to the people that do the chairs. That's their ministry. We all chip in. So let's try to develop that as a church in terms of not just the chairs, but in other ways. How can we serve one another? How can we help one another? Look out for opportunities. You know, uh, I don't know why I'm on, a, I'm on a roll today with a trombone, but you know, if you, if you, if you, if you pick up the trombone, you have a go and you, you think, oh my word, there's an anointing on me. Ooh, I get the shakes. You know, when I play the trombone, I'm amazing at this. Great. But if you pick up the trombone, you go, yeah, maybe not. That just sounds like someone in the church has passed wind. That's quite, that's quite bad. That doesn't sound too good. So I don't, I don't, think, um, I don't think maybe that will be for you. But you don't know, do you, unless you have a go. Have a go, church. And finally, receive ongoing counsel. That's the hard bit for me. When you want to blow your trombone, and I have to come to you and say, love you, but... I'm not sure trombone ministry is for you. That's okay to take godly, hopefully godly, encouraging counsel. Uh, but I will say, but you know what I have noticed? You're amazing at that. Why don't, you, why don't you give yourself a bit more to that? You're really good at that. You could really grow in that. So all joking aside, it's important to say, brothers, sisters, you know, people you love and trust, how do you think I could best serve the body? What do you think God's called me to do that will be a blessing to them? I love it when people, as the elders, we love it, don't we, guys? When people come and say, how can, I, how can I serve? How can I be part of what God's doing here? It's beautiful. We're not into a one-man show or any person show where somebody just does all the work. That's never been the intention in God's heart from day one. The body of Christ, the community of believers, serving one another, caring for one another. I'm done. I'm just going to pray and maybe invite the band to come back. I just want to say something very important today to, to one or two of us maybe. If you don't know this Jesus, I have to tell you, you're missing out. You really, really are. I'm not calling you today to some sort of churchianity or some, some bunch of rituals that you follow through because that's what your parents or your grandparents did or the traditions of your fathers. I'm calling you to a relationship with a man who's the most beautiful man I've ever met. There will never be anybody that compares like him. Take all your greatest, combine them all together, they'll still fall massively short of his greatness. No one in this room needs to be apologetic about Jesus. Nobody has to say, well, actually, actually, I follow Jesus. No one has to apologize for loving someone. We keep hearing about all this, you know, express who you love. I'll tell you who I love. I love a man. Oh, wow, that's a shock, Al. I love a man. He's called Jesus. That's the man I love. And I love my wife second. But I love him. I'm glad I've got my wife. But even if I never had my wife and I'd never met her, I still love him. Because he's the best. How else can I put it? You've got the heart. I think, I think you've got the heart. You know what I'm saying. So today, if you're here and you're thinking, I don't know if I'm into all this or not, do me a favor. Well, 
Why don't you just say, Jesus, I'm not very sure about all this stuff, but here I am. Reveal yourself to me in some way. It might not be as dramatic as it was for Saul, but let, let me know who you are. Let me know again and again what you've done. And I'm open, even just today, I'm open to the possibility that I could follow after you because you seem to be an amazing person from what this man is saying. Can I just say one last thing? It's quite difficult. When, I, was, I was thinking this earlier on a slightly funny note. When, when you go to YouTube, if you ever listen to this message again, please don't follow the subtitles. All right, it's not Redeemer's fault, but usually the subtitles have absolutely no idea how to follow my accent, okay? So don't follow the subtitles. If you're here in person, you've got a chance, right? If you can hear it, you've got a chance. But if you follow the subtitles, who knows what message you'll get? It might be something, it might be something really bizarre, all right? But there we go. God is so good. Let's pray, Father. It's good to have fun in your house, but I'll tell you something. It's beautiful to know your son. We cannot think of anybody else. We will never be able to think of anybody else who compares to how beautiful he is. And we just come to the afresh and say, we're yours. We've been purchased with precious blood, shed on our behalf, we thank you for the great price that was paid to buy us back. We are eternally grateful. And we pray today for those who are just a wee bit undecided. I pray today would be the, a brand new day. I pray that it would be a fresh day. I pray that it would be a day where someone just says, Amen, I'm yours. You gave it all for me. I will give it all for you. We pray for such a heart. And Lord, for those of us who've walked with you for quite some time, Keep it fresh, Lord. Keep it fresh. Every day, right till we get raptured or we die before. <clears throat> Let every day be filled with wonder and awe and joy and peace and grace and mercy and love. Till the day we go, that we will go blazing hot. Not like a damp squib but we'll go blazing hot to be with you. We want to end well. We want to end in triumphantly declaring his goodness all the way to the end. Thank you for what lies before us. Thank you for an eternal life. Thank you for a blessed hope. And thank you most of all for the embrace of the Lord Jesus when we see him in glory. Thank you for the great days to come. Lord, while we're here, help us to be fruitful. Help us to be increasingly getting to know you and to make you known whatever it costs, we pray, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <laughs>